Sesqui Centennial State Park is known as Sesqui and is a 1,400-acre park in the Sand Hills of South Carolina. Sesqui State Park is very close to the state's capital. In fact, the symbol for this park is an outline of the city behind a canopy of trees. As a result, this park is a popular place for locals and those wishing to visit the capital while staying in a more relaxing environment. However, we actually camped here because Sesqui State Park is so close to other state parks we wanted to visit, like Lake Watery State Park, which is only around 45 minutes away. Some of the unique things to do while visiting Sesqui State Park include looking at an old cabin, picnicking under the pines, hiking, biking, exploring the lake by renting a boat, fishing, bird watching, geocaching, letting your children enjoy the two playgrounds, and or taking your dog to the dog park. In addition, Sesqui offers a lot of printable activities on their website, like scavenger hunt. Notably, Sesqui also participates in the free Junior Ranger program. However, one of the most popular activities at Sesqui during the hot summer months happens to be their splash pad. The splash pad really made this park my kids' favorite as there were many children their age to play with. During our visit, we made sure to check out the Sesqui Centennial Monument, which celebrates the members of the Sesqui Centennial Commission and their role in creating this park. In addition, as always, we had to enjoy one of the hiking trails. While Sesqui has four trails, we hiked the Jackson Creek Nature Trail that follows the shoreline of the lake to a waterfall spillway, and the Sand Hills Hiking Trail, which is a 1.9 mile easy trail. This trail offers views of longleaf pines and a number of boardwalks that cross wet areas. Notably, in the spring and early summer months online, it states that if you take this trail, you will be treated to the beauty of wildflowers and the cinnamon scent of the sweet pepper bush. Like most of our state parks, Sesqui has a unique history. Originally, these lands were inhabited by the Congaree, Watery, Catawba, and Cherokee tribes, who settled the land between 12,000 and 10,000 BCE. Between 1715 and 1716, the Yemassee War took place in South Carolina, which was an attempt by the indigenous tribes of South Carolina to drive out the white colonists. Following this conflict, many people and tribes, like the Congaree, moved to various areas. In 1740, Philip Jackson acquired 250 acres in a location called Green Hill, which is near the land that would become Sesquicentennial State Park. Just as the Yemassee War caused many people, such as the Congaree, to relocate, between 1760 and 1761, the Cherokee War resulted in the Cherokees movement from central South Carolina. The first man 
who was documented as owning the land where the park now sits was James Douglas. James owned the property by 1842. By 1860, he enslaved 18 people. Their names remain unknown. However, census data has revealed that their ages ranged from 1 to 67. They were most likely male, and some are listed as black, while others were listed as mixed race. The people who were enslaved here were forced to grow food crops, tend livestock, and run the saw and grist mills that were powered by the nearby creek. Archaeologists' research seeks to identify locations where they may have lived and toiled. By 1881, Corley's Chapel was built on the land. After the Civil War and during the Jim Crow era, schools and churches formed a crucial social network for the growing African-American community around what would later become Sesqui State Park. Founded by William Pulski, Corley was an African Methodist Episcopal AME church. Corley's Chapel remained open until at least 1916. The chapel also had a cemetery, which is still in use even today. In 1886, following James Douglas's death, ownership of the land passed to John B. Dent and his son, John Dent. When John Jr. passed in 1899, ownership of the land went to John Dent's widow and children. On the land, between 1886 until at least 1900, workers extracted turpentine from the trees and also cut them down for logging, causing severe deforestation. Most of the people working in the turpentine industry were African American. Chippers cut a chevron pattern into the bark to stimulate the flow of sap. Dippers then collected the crude turpentine from boxes cut into the base of the tree. Extracting turpentine left distinctive V shaped scars in the trunks of trees also known as cat faces. So, if you visit Sesqui, look for these scars, some of which may be almost 100 years old. By 1913, Corley's Chapel School is listed in the superintendent's report as having one teacher and an average of 44 students. By the 1930s, the Civilian Conservation Corps built 16 segregated, white-only state parks, including Sesqui. Notably, the CCC also built several segregated parks for blacks only elsewhere in the state. In February of 1935, the Sesquicentennial Commission was established to celebrate the 150th anniversary of Columbia being the capital. To do this, they sold over 200,000 commemorative coins to raise money for a week-long celebration. By June of that year, the CCC Company number 4469, known locally as the Pontiac CCC, was established. This company would later be responsible for the construction of this park. In August of 1937, the Sesquicentennial Commission purchased 1,415.5 acres from the dents for $14,857.50. As of 
as previously mentioned, due to heavy logging and turpentine extraction, the land suffered. In fact, in a 1905 description of the land, it was noted that almost all of the longleaf pine trees on the 1,000 plus acres were gone, and the ones that remained were in poor condition. During the park's construction in the 1930s, the CCC carried out a replanting initiative, which included longleaf and faster-growing slash pine trees to reforest the land as quickly as possible. During this time, in 1938, the CCC also built picnic shelters that were equipped with fireplaces and picnic tables. Like most other CCC structures in the park, the picnic shelters were constructed from concrete. When the park finally opened, these shelters offered a great place to gather and demonstrated the social aspect that made Sesqui State Park so popular when it first opened. By August of 1938, the CCC began working to dam Jackson Creek. This was done to expand an old mill pond into a 30-acre lake. The lake was originally used for swimming, boating, and fishing, though swimming is no longer allowed. It is worth mentioning, while here, notice how much of the landscape in the area has changed since after the park was established from a former agricultural area to now being filled with trees. During the construction of this park, the CCC built several concrete structures, including a bathhouse. When the bathhouse first opened to the public in 1940, it was used primarily as a changing room. It cost 15 cents for adults and 10 cents for children. In the center of the building, there was a concession stand that sold drinks and ice cream. Today, this bathhouse has been converted into the boathouse. On April 21st of 1940, racial tensions resulted in a violent conflict between CCC workers and black soldiers stationed at Fort Jackson. By June of 1940, the park officially opened, though not fully constructed. By July of that year, the Forestry Commission described it as being roughly 25% done. While Waddell Fire Tower was originally built at Fort Jackson in South Carolina, by 1940, it was moved to Sesqui State Park. That is because during the 40s and 50s, towermen lived near this tower, so they could focus almost all of their attention on watching for fires. These towermen were appointed to monitor the forest from the lookout tower during fire season from October the 1st to May 31st. Waddell Fire Tower is one of the highest points in Richland County, though it is not used or open for public access today. In 1941, after the construction of the Sesquicentennial Lake Dam and Spillway, the South Carolina Forestry Commission took over management responsibilities of the park. Between 1942 and 1945, during World War II, timber became a valuable resource and local forest fires were recognized by the U.S. Army as a significant threat to these resources. It was also during this time that Smokey the Bear was created to encourage fire safety. 
following World War II, in 1946, the Forestry Commission began installing electricity infrastructures to power individual cabins and group camping areas. By 1961, a group of students from Allen and Benedict Universities and the NAACP organized an integration challenge and attempted to enter Sesquicentennial State Park. This gathering contributed to the lawsuit Brown v. South Carolina Forestry Commission, which challenged the segregation of all of South Carolina's state parks. It took until 1963 when it was finally ruled all South Carolina parks must be desegregated and open to visitors of all races. Unfortunately, three weeks before the date Judge Martin had issued for the park's integration, the Forestry Commission officially closed all of South Carolina's state parks. The closures continued until June 1st of 1964 when the Forestry Commission reopened the state parks, including Sesquicentennial, but the lakes remained closed for swimming until 1966. By 1967, the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Tourism, PRT, took over management of the park. Between 1968 and 1980, the Miss South Carolina State Parks pageants were held at the Sesquicentennial State Park to promote the park. The pageants would choose an attractive female college student to serve as an image for the park system. These women would go into local communities and encourage the communities to visit the state parks. Unlike most parks, because of this, Sesquicentennial had a very large amphitheater. In addition to the pageants, other performances were hosted here, including the Liberty Tree, which was a historical play based on South Carolina's role in the American Revolution. Notably, from 1970 to 1975, the amphitheater here was leased to USC's drama department. Over time, the amphitheater fell out of use, and today the grounds are fenced off from the public. In 1969, a log cabin was brought to Sesquicentennial from Earlwood, South Carolina. This was done in an effort to preserve the structure, although it had no connection to the local park's landscape. At one point, park visitors could go inside the structure to purchase souvenirs and learn about early settlements in the Carolina frontier. Today, while visiting Sesqui State Park, you can stay at one of the 78 standard sites or one of the nine full-service campsites. In addition, if you're in a group, you may want to stay in one of the five primitive camping areas, which can host up to 50 people per site. During our visits to Sesquicentennial State Park, there were many things that we really enjoyed and, like always, a few negative things. In regards to the positive, some of the things that we noticed that we really liked included the really wide road. The roads are so nice here. The flat areas for bike riding. It makes me really excited to get back to the state park when my kids are a little bit older so we can explore the biking trails. The sandy and non-rocky camping site areas. Next, during our first trip in the summer, we had a lot of luck fishing near the dam with live worms. 
This state park has a lot of really interesting events, like their artisan market and their Halloween event for pets. During our first trip, when we went to hike, I really appreciated how you could push a stroller on most of the trail easily. This state park has a lot of picnic areas, and it has one beautiful picnic shelter which happens to have Spanish tile. And lastly, this could be positive or negative depending on who you are, but there are a lot of kids and a lot of dogs at this state park. On the other hand, the things I feel are more negative about this state park happens to be the not well-marked trails. It's common in our state parks to not have very well-marked trails, and when you have multiple trails, it's easy to get sidetracked. Second, it's not really the park's fault, but I was very nervous because I know there are a lot of alligators in Columbia. And when we were canoeing, we got to some very shallow spots where I thought we might get stuck. And I'm not sure what I would have done. Next, I chose to stay at state parks rather than use a few new websites where you can stay on someone's property for way cheaper. And the reason I chose to do this is I felt safer at a state park. This state park does happen to lock its gate. However, I've noticed more rural state parks are a little lax when it comes to locking their gate. That being said, I felt safer in the state park than if I was just camping on somebody's land alone. However, while we were staying here, when I was getting ready for bed, my son happened to headbutt me and blood went everywhere. And I know I screamed like I was being murdered, but not one person came to check on me. And that kind of made me question if it was really worth <laughs> spending the extra money for my false sense of security. And finally, the most negative thing that I can say about this state park is it has an absolutely awful, terrible, no excuse for it, bad handicap site. <laughs> It is close to the rest area, but that's the only thing I can say good about it. There is a tree directly in the middle, and I would be so upset if I got that campsite. It says nature trail. Nature trail. This way says nature trail. All right, well, let's go, but let's watch for snakes. Go. Yeah, well, they're mm -hmm. not ready. They're uh, wild but grapes. Black. They're black. called musky dines. They're mm -hmm. a native to the area. We love they musky have a dines. They're sweet with a tough skin. We love musky dines. Is that right? Well, I don't think you've ever had a musky dine, but yes, they're very good, but they do have seeds in them. You see? The yellow-billed sap sucker. When you see neat rows of holes in a tree, that's who did it. I thought it was a woodpecker. Oh, it is a small type of a woodpecker. I see one. Yeah, they're I see in. A hole. I see a hole. I see a hole with them. But I don't think it made that hole. I, I'm, I I like on anyway, trees. they have red foreheads. I climb on trees. Oh, yeah. yeah. I climb on this Maybe tree. it is that tree. Carl, I don't see. think you'll be able to climb up that tree, Carl. Because it. Because there's no branches. I see oh. the I see the holes though. It is in that tree. See those neat holes that are in lines. Galls, insect galls. A gall is a swelling of plant tissue, uh -huh. usually due to an insect parasite. I think I think an exit. I think a a little bitty bug with an So I guess that's what these uh, things we've been seeing are, parasites. 
Mm. Where is one? Loblolly Pine. This common pine in south, the southeast is Mama, also in Arkansas and North Carolina. Mama, I think it's uh -huh. that one. Yeah, I think so. It can get to be 150 feet in height, and the needles are 6 to 9 inches long. Like that one. Yeah. Like that one. Like that one. Yep, let's go find your brother. Your brother's gone. That is the toll tree apple. Forest layer. Plant communities are made up of different types of vegetation. Like, the like that one. Is, like that one. It's so tall you can't see it. Yeah, so they're just saying different um, levels. There's different types of plants that grow at different levels. I hear a tree. There's a bird on the sign. Let's see. No, oh. I need to hold it. Oh, it's a Carolina wren. That's our state I bird. Hold it. I hold it. Oh, I was missing. Mm -hmm. They they uh, have a clear uh, song and is often written as tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. I think we hear that. Oh, and it's a small chunky wren. I, and I it has think that's white the one. eyebrows. Oh yeah, I see that. I think and a the long one. tail. I I saw that. It's a box turtle. What does that one say? It's a bird. It is a bird. Mm -hmm. I to find Some type of woodpecker. I to find yeah, that that's leaf. nice. Sassafras. The leaves hey, and Mama. twigs of this small tree Mama, are aromatic. I, I, I hear what's lying. Hmm. The root and bark are medicinal. It looks like a dinosaur foot. I don't see one out here. Green. Look at this daddy's squirrel. It's green. Mm, a flying squirrel. I didn't know flying squirrels were around here. They can jump and fly. They probably only stay up high. <laughs> look, look, Carl. What is this? It's a deer. It's a white-tailed deer. Eastern fence lizard. The medium sized reptile grows to seven and a half inches. It grabs my gas. Mm, look, come here. It eats insects and spiders. Do you see any lizards? Um, yeah. Mm, look around. <laughs> Carl. I know you found it. I know. I saw a squirrel. I saw a squirrel. It went across the road. Whoa. Okay. It went. Well, this is a. It was a flying squirrel. This is a longleaf pine and it's fire resistant. Look, that's about lichen. Kind of looks like moss, but it's a fungi. Whole out organism. It's a fungus and an algae that grow together. So anyway, can you find oh, it out look, here? Look, Mama. It's a boat. I found some. It's a boat. I it's found a some lichen. And light. What does it say? Oh, it's talking about dogwood trees. And look, this is a dogwood tree. Hey, dogwood mm -hmm. tree. And sometimes they have really pretty flowers. But right now... Why? Right now, there's only a little bud. No, it's Daddy, about those cactuses that I touched. And they're called prickly pears. And that they're a cold the tolerant. Yep, yeah, they're a cold tolerant cactus with a yellow flower. That was the and one they you have touched? an edible purple fruit. That's the one you touched. Mm -hmm. And they're native to South Carolina. I find one with you. And they have uh, sharp Mama, spines. Mama, I find one. Mm-hmm. You don't be careful because I still got them things in my hand somewhere. Look, you can see one sticking out of my finger. Hey, you found a sign. Scenery with a purpose. Mom's over there. Mama, you steady head. Look up. Okay. Wayne. Look, we were over there. Yep, we were. Dad, three of them. The baby one, the daddy one. And the mommy one. Is that right up in the roof? Is that right? Yep. Oh, it talks about green frogs. Yes. And how they love ponds. The no, green. I hold it. 
I find the sun. They might pawn like yeah. this. The males wrestle with each other. I find the sun. Let's see it. A goose? Yeah, a goose wheel. <laughs> A flashlight. Tell them thank you. Thank you. Oh wow! Say thank you. Anyway, I'm not sure what is back there, but it looks like a stadium. Stadium. But I'm not real sure. <laughs> This log house was built by hand by longleaf pine logs sometime during the 18th or 19th century. An attempt to date it through tree ring analysis indicates that it was constructed in 1754, though more detailed studies is needed to confirm this date. It is likely that the log house is one of the earliest surviving homes in the area. The house was originally located in the northwest side of Columbia. And it was in such poor condition that it had to be condemned and was saved by the Ottoman family and the woman and the women's club of Columbia who donated it to the state park. So will we go back to Sesqui State Park? Well, yes, we actually have already been twice this year, once in the summer and once during the fall. I feel like we will end up back at this park when we go to explore Columbia or when our children are old enough to experience the park's full moon hike. In addition, I would also like to go back when my children are old enough to bike the 3.5 mile loop road hiking and biking trail and the 6.1 mile Sesqui mountain bike trail. I hope that you found this video interesting and as always thanks for watching. Yeah, that was really good. <laughs>